We're always talking about Mars here on the Guide to Space, and for good reason. Mars is awesome, and there's a fleet of spacecraft orbiting, probing, and crawling around the surface of Mars. The red planet is the focus of so much of our attention because it's reasonably close and offers humanity a viable place for a second home. Well, not exactly viable, but with the right technology and techniques, we might be able to make a sustainable civilization there. We've mapped the surface of Mars in great detail, and we know what it looks like from the surface. But there's another planet we need to keep in mind, Venus. It's bigger and closer than Mars. And sure, it's a hellish deathscape that would kill you in moments if you ever set foot on it, but it's still pretty interesting and mysterious to visit. Would it surprise you to know that many spacecraft have actually made it down to the surface of Venus and photographed the place from the ground? It was an amazing feat of Soviet engineering, and there are some new technologies in the works that might help us get back and explore it longer. So today, let's talk about the Soviet Venera program, the first time humanity saw Venus from its surface. Back in the 60s, in the height of the Cold War, the Americans and the Soviets were racing to be the first to explore the solar system. First satellite to orbit Earth, Soviets. First human to orbit Earth, Soviets. First flyby and landing of the moon, Soviets. First flyby of Mars, Americans. First flyby of Venus, Americans, etc. The Soviets set their sights on putting a lander down on the surface of Venus. But as we know, this planet has some unique challenges. Every place on the entire planet measures the same 462 degrees Celsius, or 864 Fahrenheit. Furthermore, the atmospheric pressure on the surface of Venus is 90 times greater than Earth. Being down at the bottom of that column of atmosphere is the same as being beneath a kilometer of ocean on Earth. Remember those submarine movies where they dive too deep and they get crushed like a soda can? It's like that. Finally, it rains sulfuric acid. I mean, it's really irritating. Needless to say, figuring this out took the Soviets a few tries. Their first attempt to even fly by Venus was Venera 1 on February 4, 1961, but it failed to even escape Earth orbit. This was followed by Venera 2, launched on November 12, 1965, and it went off course just after launch. Venera 3 blasted off on November 16, 1965, and was intended to land on the surface of Venus, but the Soviets lost communication with the spacecraft. It's believed that it actually did crash land on Venus, so I guess that was the first successful landing on Venus. Now before I continue, I'd like to talk a little about landing on planets. As we've discussed in the past, landing on Mars is really, really hard. The atmosphere is thick enough that spacecraft will burn up if you aim directly for the surface, but it's not thick enough to let you use parachutes to gently land on the surface. Landing on the surface of Venus, on the other hand, is super easy. The atmosphere is so thick that you can use parachutes no problem. And if you can get on target and deploy a parachute capable of handling the terrible environment, your soft landing is pretty much assured. Now, surviving down there is another story, but we'll get to that. Venera 4 came next, launched on June 12, 1967. The Soviets had a few clues about what the surface of Venus was actually like. They didn't know the atmospheric pressure, guessing it might be a little higher pressure than Earth, or maybe it was hundreds of times their pressure. It was tested with high temperatures and brutal deceleration. They thought they'd built this thing plenty tough. Venera 4 arrived at Venus on October 18, 1967, and tried to survive a landing. Temperatures on its heat shield were clocked at 11,000 Celsius, and it experienced 300 Gs of deceleration. The initial temperature at 52 kilometers was a nice 33 Celsius, but then as it descended down towards the surface, temperatures increased to 262 Celsius, and then they lost contact with the probe killed dead by the horrible temperature. We can assume it landed though, and for the first time, scientists caught a glimpse of just how bad it is down there on the surface of Venus. Venera 5 was launched on January 5, 1969, and was built tougher, learning from the lessons of Venera 4. It also made it into the Venus atmosphere, returned some interesting science about the planet, and then died before it reached the surface. 
Venera 6 followed, same deal. Built tougher, died in the atmosphere, returned some useful science. Venera 7 was built with a fuller understanding of how bad it was down there on Venus. It launched on August 17, 1970 and arrived in December. It's believed that the parachutes on the spacecraft only partially deployed, allowing it to descend more quickly through the Venusian atmosphere than originally planned. It smacked into the surface, going about 16.5 meters per second. But amazingly, it survived and continued to send back a weak signal to Earth for about 23 minutes. For the first time ever, a spacecraft had made it down to the surface of Venus and communicated its status. I'm sure it was just 23 minutes of robotic screaming, but still, progress. Scientists got their first accurate measurement of the temperatures and pressure down there. Bottom line, humans could never survive on the surface of Venus. Venera 8 blasted off for Venus on March 17, 1972, and the Soviet engineers built it to survive the descent and landing for as long as possible. It made it through the atmosphere, landed on the surface, and returned data for about 50 minutes. Now, it didn't have a camera, but it did have a light sensor, which told scientists being on Venus was kind of like Earth on an overcast day. Enough light to take pictures next time. For the next missions, the Soviets went back to the drawing board and built entirely new landing craft, built big, heavy, and tough, designed to get to the surface of Venus and survive long enough to send back data and pictures. Venera 9 was launched on June 8, 1975. It survived the atmospheric descent and landed on the surface of Venus. The lander was built with a liquid-cooled reverse insulated pressure vessel using circulating fluid to keep the electronics cooled as long as possible. In this case, that was 53 minutes. Venera 9 measured clouds of acid, bromine, and other toxic chemicals, and sent back grainy black and white television pictures from the surface of Venus. The lens cap on its color camera didn't deploy. In fact, these were the first pictures ever taken from the surface of another planet. Venera 10 lasted for 65 minutes and took pictures of the surface with one camera, and the lens cap on its second camera didn't release. Spacecraft saw lava rocks with layers of other rocks in between, similar environments to what you might see on Earth. Venera 11 was launched on September 9, 1975, and lasted for 95 minutes on the surface of Venus. In addition to confirming the horrible environment discovered by the other landers, Venera 7 detected lightning strikes in the vicinity. Now, it was equipped with a color camera, but again, the lens cap failed to deploy for it or the black and white camera, so it failed to send any pictures home. Venera 12 launched on September 14, 1978, and made it down to the surface of Venus. It lasted 110 minutes and returned detailed information about the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Unfortunately, both its camera lens caps failed to deploy, so again, no pictures were returned. And pictures are all we really care about, right? Venera 13 was built on the same, tougher, beefier design and was blasted off to Venus on October 30th, 1981. And this one was a tremendous success. It landed on Venus and survived for 127 minutes. It took pictures of its surroundings using two cameras, color and black and white, peering through quartz windows and saw a landscape of bedrock. It used spring-loaded arms to test out how compressible the soil was. Venera 14 was identical and launched just five days after Venera 13. It also landed and survived for 57 minutes. Unfortunately, its experiment to test the compressibility of the soil was a botch because one of its lens caps landed right under the arm, and so it tested the compressibility of the lens cap. Apart from that, it sent back color pictures of the hellish landscape. And with that, the Soviet Venus landing program ended. And since then, no additional spacecraft have ever returned to the surface of Venus. In a second, I'm going to tell you about an exciting new advancement that might make an actual rover a possibility on Venus. But first, I'd like to thank Arch Lindy, Mike Bradfield, Michael Atkinson, Christopher McCoy, Patrick Cohn, and the rest of our 690 patrons for the generous support. If you love what we're doing and you want to help out, head on over to patreon.com. Universe today. 
once again, this episode of The Guide to Space is sponsored by the dot .space domain name. Back in the olden days, when I founded Universe Today, we had limited domain name options. In fact, I based the name of my entire company on a domain name that was available, and that was 18 years ago. It's so much worse today. Well, those dark days are over, and now you can get a domain name that matches your interests at a reasonable price, like dot .space. Go to www.launch.space, use the offer code Guide to Space, and you can get your own dot .space domain for only $2.99 instead of the usual $9.99. Thanks again to dot .space for sponsoring this episode. Now, back to the show. It's one thing to make a lander to survive on the surface of Venus last few minutes and then die from the horrible environment. What we really want is some kind of rover, like Curiosity, which would last on the surface of Venus for weeks, months, or even years and do more science. And computers don't like this kind of heat. Go ahead, put your computer in the oven, set it for 850 degrees. Oh, no, your oven doesn't go to 850? That's fine, because that would be insane. Seriously, don't do it, it would be bad. Engineers at NASA's Glenn Research Center have developed a new kind of electrical circuitry that might be able to handle those kinds of temperatures. The new circuits were tested in the Glenn Extreme Environments Rig, which can simulate the surface of Venus. It can mimic the temperature, pressure, and even the chemistry of Venus's atmosphere. The circuitry, originally designed for hot jet engine, lasted for 521 hours, functioning perfectly in this environment. So if all goes well, future Venus rovers could be developed to survive on the surface of Venus without needing the complex and short-lived cooling systems. And this discovery might unleash a whole new era of exploration of Venus to confirm once and for all that it really, truly sucks. While the Soviets had a tough time with Mars, they really nailed it with Venus. You could see how they built and launched spacecraft after spacecraft, sticking with this challenge until they got the pictures and the data that they were looking for. I really think this series is one of the triumphs of the robotic space exploration, and I look forward to future mission concepts that pick up where the Soviets left off. Are you excited about the prospects of exploring Venus with rovers? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Now, have you heard the news that we might actually be living in a hologram? What does it even mean? In our next episode, I'll try to explain the holographic universe and what that actually means for us and I might bring in a special guest. It's one thing to explore Venus, but another thing to be able to actually live there. Here's a video that explains what it might take to terraform Venus into a place that sucks less. And there are some new technologies in the world. Oh, 